My name's Hannah, and I'm auditioning for the role of Jomine Ramsey. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 true crime Netflix documentaries. For this list, we're looking at Netflix's best docu-series and documentary films about true crime. If you haven't gotten around to watching these yet, let this be your spoiler alert. Which true crime doc had you glued to your screen? Sound off in the comments. Number 20, Girl in the Picture. Based on a pair of books, this doc focuses on Sharon Marshall, a young girl who was abducted by Franklin Delano Floyd. There's a big question here. What happened to Sharon Marshall in this time period between high school until she was found dead on the side of the road? After kidnapping Marshall and raising her as his own, the felon assaulted the minor and eventually forced her into marriage. As Tanya, she was held captive for two decades until 1990, when she died in a suspicious hit and run. When I first learned that uh, Tanya was actually killed by a hit and run driver, it was more than likely Franklin Floyd that had committed that. I mean, this guy was gonna be violent. Catching him might be tricky. The documentary brings truth to the story that initially broke long ago, which stated that Tanya was staying with her husband Clarence before the accident. But an FBI investigation followed, bringing insight to something much more convoluted. I called the FBI, I called the hotline, and I said, you know, there was a news report in Atlanta about a, a girl named Tanya. I know who she is, her name's Sharon Marshall. Tanya was discovered to be Sharon, and Clarence, Floyd. It's a story of horrific twists and turns that are truly unbelievable. Number 19, Keep Sweet, Pray and Obey. Leading an extreme offshoot of Mormonism, Warren Jeffs perpetuated systematic abuse for years before his arrest in the mid-2000s. We were so scared, you know? We were gonna be condemned to hell if we did anything different. You have to submit yourself. Because it was for our salvation. You did whatever it took, even if it was wrong. As head of the Polygamous Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or FLDS, Jeffs forced members of his congregation, including minors, into living out the FLDS's mantra, keep sweet, pray, and obey. This meant entering marriages where wives are expected to blindly serve their husbands, have children, and control their emotions. It meant to be in control of your emotions, and you didn't display things like anger or resentment or frustration, especially towards the fathers and husbands. The doc tells the stories of former FLDS members, which bring to light the disturbing details of being held captive in a cult lifestyle. More importantly, the interviewees' testimonies represent the strength of the women who survived the abuse. Number 18, Sins of Our Mother. This three-parter following Lori Vallow, AKA the Doomsday Mom, exposes the dangers of extreme religious views. Did a religious group's beliefs lead to the disappearances of JJ Vallow and Tylee Ryan? She and her fifth husband, Chad Daybell, landed behind bars after a string of deaths. Accused of first-degree murder, the extremist duo is awaiting trial after the deaths of Lori's previous husband, Chad's former wife, and two of Lori's kids. So I met my bishop and I was like, I'm either going to turn my life to the temple or I'm going to commit murder. And I was perfectly honest because at that point I had nothing to lose. The events preceding the horrors are explored via a slew of shocking material, including police accounts, phone calls, emails, podcasts, and interviews with people close to Lori who experienced her spiral into darkness. She was genuinely frightened. I mean, she actually went so far as to say, it's going to be so scary. Sometimes I think it would be better to just go off the side of a cliff in a car with my kids and then to live through the end times. A spiritual point system, demonic possession, the apocalypse, and the belief that Lori is, quote, a resurrected god will likely be referenced when the pair stand trial in 2023. Number 17, Athlete A. Thanks to a source's suggestion to investigate USA Gymnastics, America's gymnastics governing body, the Indianapolis Star began conducting research on alleged abuse. And so as I was looking at a broader piece on, why does this seem to keep happening? Why do people not report as they're required to do? 
A source suggested that I look at USA Gymnastics. A team of journalists found that coaches had taken advantage of their power and mistreated hundreds of gymnasts, prompting a published story. The piece was followed by justice-seeking athletes coming forward and revealing their traumatic experiences, specifically at the hands of USA Gymnastics physician Larry Nasser. They're covering things up for the coaches. I think they would be covering it up for him. And that was the first time I had heard there could be something wrong with uh, Larry Nasser. After years of abuse without consequence, criminal prosecution was finally initiated. It was learned that USA Gymnastics was made aware of the doctor's horrific behavior, but failed to act, exposing just how harmful the culture that has silently plagued the world of gymnastics had become. Number 16, American Murder, The Family Next Door. Using a combination of archival footage, social media posts, texts, recordings, and home videos, this doc dives into the Watts family murders of 2018. But this guy right here, he's gonna do all the dishes. That's me. I'd rather bake and he can clean. And then I can eat it later. It is not until midway through the film that we learn that Chris, the Watts patriarch, ruthlessly took the lives of his pregnant wife and two daughters, shattering the all-American facade. There's a reason you feel sick to your stomach. When people hold stuff inside, it makes you physically ill. And I can just tell on your face, I could tell you tell from the second you walked in that you were wanting to just come clean and just be done with this. Beyond thoroughly explaining how Chris committed the unthinkable, the documentary tries to piece together the why. But even with the theories put forward, it's difficult to fathom the horrific nature of what he did, making this a truly haunting experience. Number 15, Killer Inside, The Mind of Aaron Hernandez. Aaron Hernandez was the pro footballer who seemed to have it all. When this day began, Aaron Hernandez was a New England Patriots tight end. Tonight, he is the defendant in a murder case. But success aside, the athlete was deeply troubled, evidenced by his murder of a fellow athlete, suspected role in other killings, and eventual death. By detailing the football star's upbringing and degenerative brain disease, the series aims to capture a shocking spiral. As the title suggests, we're given access to the mind of the killer while he's in jail thanks to the inclusion of phone calls made by Hernandez in prison. My whole body's shaking right now. And why is it shaking? I had to call you to calm down. I was about to beat somebody's ass. Why? What happened? Nothing. Some ass arguments, but you know my temper. While deeply chilling, the doc serves as a reminder that mental and physical trauma profoundly impact human decision-making, even that of those who appear well-positioned to do better. Number 14, Bad Vegan, Fame, Fraud, Fugitives. As the owner of the popular vegan spot Pure Food and Wine in New York City, Sarma Melangalis was an elite restaurateur making quite a name for herself in the industry. Sarma was the raw vegan queen. People were coming from all over the world because of her. It was a movement. However, in 2015, she stopped paying her staff for months and they walked out en masse. Behind the scenes, she had entered into a relationship with Anthony Strongis, who promised he could make her and her pit bull Leon immortal. I just remember feeling like he understood me, which meant a lot. I feel like he understood I was trying to grow this business and this brand that I believed in with all my heart, and this meant everything to me, and I had to kind of overcome all of these things. Melon Gallus later claimed that Strongis used coercive control to convince her to steal $1.6 million from her restaurant and go on the run with him. The Netflix series details the bizarre story and Melon Gallus's allegations, including the couple's capture and criminal charges. Number 13, Strong Island. One of the more deeply personal Netflix documentaries, Strong Island is sure to leave you equally sad and angry. At the center of it all is William Ford, a young black New York teacher fatally shot by a white 19-year-old mechanic on Long Island. Kevin came to me and he said, Mark Riley shot William. Although Ford was unarmed, an all-white grand jury opted to not indict his killer. The story itself is a wrenching viewing experience, made even more so by the fact that the documentary was directed by Yance Ford, William's own brother. Number 12, The Innocent Man. 
Author John Grisham may be primarily known for his fiction, but in 2006, he published a non-fiction true crime book called The Innocent Man, Murder and Injustice in a Small Town. And evidently, it was like uh, Grand Central Station over there as far as police officers or crime scene. The book and this series focus on Ronald Ron Keith Williamson, who was convicted of murders in the 1980s that took place in Ada, Oklahoma. He was eventually exonerated because of DNA evidence. And Mr. Williamson, sir, you'll be discharged also from the Department of Corrections and from the Pontotoc County Sheriff's Office. Netflix explores all of the false confessions that occurred and includes many interviews with key players in the real-life drama. Susie Fay of the Financial Times said, quote, The story is ingeniously played out, each episode ending on a cliffhanger that makes binge watching virtually unavoidable. In, in some ways, I said, Are you a god or are you the devil? And as soon as I said that, I woke up. Number 11 The Confession Killer. In most true crime docs, someone is eventually found guilty, but this one is especially interesting because that's not the case. After killing his own mother and two other victims, Henry Lee Lucas confessed to hundreds of other murders. I've killed him in every way there is except poison. This set off an investigation into his abundance of admissions, which turned out to be lies. Murder cases across the U.S. were subsequently closed without evidence, but eyebrows concerning likelihood and logistics were still raised. The really sad thing about this, the real tragedy, is someone got away with murder. Whether Lucas was a pathological liar and or rampant murderer, the documentary serves as some sort of closure for families of victims whose cases were not properly handled. Number 10, Wild Wild Country. One of true crime's bizarrest stories is told in Wild Wild Country, a six-part series covering Indian guru Osho, who creates a community in Oregon. The controversial leader, with help from his assistant Ma Anandshila, set up a commune for his followers on a ranch, much to the dismay of locals in the area. A lot of people were suspicious that they had a long-term plan. Nobody could imagine that it would be something of the scale that Unfolded. Discord between Osho's community and Oregon townsfolk manifested in an equally strange and antagonistic series of events. Osho's followers engaged in bioterror and illegal wiretapping, prompting state and federal authorities to get involved. We had no idea that we were going to run into the largest poisoning case in the history of the United States, to the largest wiretapping case, and the largest immigration fraud that had occurred in the United States. A national scandal erupted, making Osho an infamous name that reminds us of an often overlooked part of American history. Number 9. Amanda Knox The story of Amanda Knox was fodder for sensationalist news outlets worldwide in 2007. If you Google the name Amanda Knox, you get 7.1 million hits. You all know better than anybody that hundreds of thousands of those are not kind. A young woman, Meredith Kircher, was murdered in Perugia, Italy, and her roommate Knox was subsequently convicted of the crime. After several years in Italian prison, Knox was acquitted and released, after evidence was found implicating someone else entirely in the crime. Rudy is telling his friend that Amanda is nowhere near the crime scene. He's saying that uh, they had nothing to do with it. She appears in the documentary to assert her innocence and to tell her side of the salacious story. The film was nominated for a Primetime Emmy for Outstanding Documentary or Nonfiction Special. Thank you for being there for me. Number 8. Abducted in Plain Sight If you want to hear a story that's just totally bonkers, you cannot miss Abducted in Plain Sight, which was made in 2017 but was picked up by Netflix and aired in early 2019. We were driving out to go horseback riding and all of a sudden I saw this white light coming down out of the sky. The tale of what happened to the Broberg family in the 1970s is so unbelievable that it will leave you screaming at your TV with every new twist and turn. It was always about sex at that point. That was what all of those encounters were about for him. While there is a lot of disturbing content in this documentary, it's not about a murder. So if you have a tough time with grisly details, this could be a good compromise. And I walked down the stairs, down the hallway to my back bedroom, and I shut the door. I was completely gone. Number seven, conversations with a killer, the Jeffrey Dahmer tapes. Similar to the Ted Bundy tapes and the John Wayne Gacy tapes, 
This docuseries sheds light on the life and horrific crimes of a serial killer. Through sharing previously unreleased recordings of discussions between the infamous Jeffrey Dahmer and his legal representation, Netflix allows us some access to the man behind the murders. There was Jeff um, sitting in the corner of the table. I was incredibly nervous because this was something that I felt was way over my head. Aside from enduring hard-to-digest details of the killer's manhunting, viewers are also prompted to think about contentious ideas surrounding law enforcement and justice. Considering Dahmer's complex mental issues and brutal murders, the series takes us on a gut-wrenching ride. I didn't make you feel at that time. Uh, depressed, lonely, and bored, and confused, I would say. Number six, don't F with cats, hunting an internet killer. We know Facebook is powerful, but it reached a new level when users Deanna Thompson and John Green created an online alliance to find a killer. That was a message he was sending. I'm throwing down a gauntlet. I dare you, I challenge you to try and find out who I am. I was like, oh, okay, this person wants to play a game of cat and mouse, and I'm up for that. After a video of a man killing kittens went viral, the manhunt began. Further videos surfaced, each more disturbing than the next, which saw the Facebook group expand. The team of investigators were ordinary people who wanted the criminal's identity confirmed, something law enforcement had yet to do. I wasn't gonna stop until I found him. I made a promise I was gonna track him down. I'm still gonna do it. Devastatingly, Thompson and Green's concerns and pursuit proved valid when another killing was posted, except this time, the victim was a human. In the end, Luca Magnata was confirmed as the killer, and the mystery was solved, solidifying this story as one that is as compelling as it is disturbing. Number five, evil genius. The story of the murder of pizza delivery man Brian Douglas Wells with a neck bomb has been called, quote, one of the most complicated and bizarre crimes in the annals of the FBI. So it was perfectly suited to get the Netflix docuseries treatment. The case is indeed a strange and complex one. And in Evil Genius, Trey Borzileri interviews one of the people who was implicated in and incarcerated for the crime, Marjorie Deal Armstrong. Regardless, Marjorie couldn't hold down a job. She struggled with daily life, started to let herself go. While there may not be a lot of legal conclusions in this case, the documentary adds an extra layer of context to what actually happened. Without a doubt, this case trumps all others as far as how bizarre it was. We had the whole device basically put back together. The problem we had was, was we could not match any tools. Number four, the Tinder swindler. This true crime hit details the convoluted scheme of Simon Leviev, a con man who takes his manipulative tactics to Tinder. He is this kind of person that you want to save, especially because he has so much responsibility on his back. Everyone is relying on him. Projecting the persona of someone who leads a luxurious life as a diamond mogul, Leviev lures women into a trap, convincing them that he needs their money to stay safe from his enemies. He can't use his cards anymore because the security team has said his enemies are tracing his spend and where he is based on his credit card use. I wanted to ask you a favor. If you have an American Express credit card, I can link it to my account. Leviev would threaten the women he conned, ghost them when he felt it necessary, and swindled up to $10 million from individuals around the world. The documentary is a captivating must-see if you're interested in witnessing one of the wildest Ponzi schemes ever carried out. Number three, The Keepers. When it was released in 2017, people could not stop talking about this docuseries. The Keepers tells the story of the murder of a nun in Baltimore, high school teacher sister Kathy Sezek, which has gone unsolved since it took place in 1969. But no one has proved that she ever came back to her apartment. Instead, she vanished. This is about much more than a simple murder case, delving into issues with the Catholic Church that have persisted for decades and a cover-up suspected by many. When you take a look at where she lived and where she was found, it's just too many coincidences. Writing for Vice, Pilot Verouette said, quote, it's harrowing and upsetting, and it will haunt you for a long time, which is part of what makes it necessary viewing. It's wrong, it's wrong what's happened, but they're still unsolved. Number two, The Staircase. In late 2001, writer Michael Peterson allegedly found his wife dead at the bottom of their staircase, 
but he was subsequently charged with her murder. My wife had an accident. She's still breathing. What kind of accident? She fell down the stairs. This story is a riveting one that is full of twists and turns, including the fact that one of Peterson's friends died in a similar way decades earlier. This is a documentary series that was gradually added to since it was first released as a French miniseries from director Jean-Xavier de Lestrade in 2004, with Netflix picking up Lestrade's new content for the story over a decade later and airing the entire series run in 2018. Okay, now seriously, what do you think of the owl theory? When you look at the wounds on Kathleen's head, the theory that a raptor caused those wounds is pretty persuasive. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Making a Murderer This Emmy Award-winning series from creators Moira Demos and Laura Ricciardi became a streaming sensation when it was first released in 2015, telling the story of Wisconsin's Stephen Avery, a man who had been wrongfully imprisoned for a 1980s sexual assault and attempted murder, and was then convicted of a separate murder almost two decades later, along with his nephew and alleged accomplice Brendan Dassey. You can't beat the evidence. Work with us a little. If you think of your family. Think of your family. I do not do it. How is your family going to be when they think you're a cold-blooded person? If you made a mistake, they'll understand that. Your blood pressure could get very high as you watch this deep dive into a legal and moral quagmire. You know, last time it took me 18 years and six weeks to prove my innocence. Uh, this time I don't know how long. The follow-up second season updated followers of the case on what had taken place since season one had wrapped. I didn't think all of these people would care about, you know, this little thing. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.